Hi everyone, welcome back to The Watch Insider. My name is Brian and thank you for logging on. I am joined tonight by Tim Masso. Welcome all. We've got an exciting show, we've got lots of great watches and we've got a special announcement. So why don't we get started with the announcement? Yeah, definitely. Um, so here at Watchbacks we have some very exciting news. Um, the video is already out but the Urban Gentry has joined the Watchbox family. Specifically, Tristano, who's the captain over on that ship, is now TGV, he's still TGV, and they're still the Urban Gentry, but they are now the Urban Gentry powered by Watchbox. You might have noticed that they announced this in advance, I didn't want to steal his thunder, and they've changed the site graphics to reflect the affiliation. His commentary's not going to change, his perspective's not going to change, his style's not going to change, we just want to add to the forces we've got, and we think we're building an unbeatable team. So Tristano, welcome to the family. Yeah, welcome to the family, um, we're super excited, and we know that you guys are going to love the content on his channel as much as you love the content on ours. So let's get the show uh, moving right along. I've got this, you know, it would be a shame if like our net connection is so slow that nobody heard that because I've got like the worst possible bit rate at the moment. Oh my God. This is, this is pretty bad. Uh, guys, <laughs> if you're seeing us, thank you for sticking with it. All right, let's talk about some watches. Let's do wrist checks. What are you wearing okay. today? So here, I'll give, I'll give you the watch. So I've been wearing this a lot recently. Uh, love the size, love the overall look, love the level of comfort. This is a 5065A. Uh, this is one of the earlier Aquanauts, you know, before the current iteration with the integrated strap to the case. Um, 38 millimeter um, automatic movement, sapphire crystal back. Um, I just, you know, love the fit. I love the flexibility of the strap and just being able to change it to different colors. Um, and, you know, it's right now it's my daily driver. And it is, it's a Luce strap, correct? It is. So you have many color options because the Luce collection is a bit more extravagant in its use of color. A lovely piece, and of course you can see that the gloss on that hobnail dial gives it a real distinct character from the Nautilus, and I happen to like that. I think the texture serves this watch well, along with the Tritium Fade. Very, very cool watch. Yeah, it's got an old world feel to me, and I just think that, uh, you know, very cool vibe. And no, no, I've never seen another loom from them that's quite this bright. All right, so real quick, let me give some shout outs to our friends joining. Dealing with our net connection tonight, Eddie Landsberg, first in the box. Vegas Milgoss and his white face, 116400 is in the box. We've got Dovid Gutwein, hello. We've got Jesus841, pardon me, Jesus841, hello from Texas. Karsten Lund from Denmark, Andrew joining in, Ernesto, Weberfan1234. I was a big Weber fan back in the day too, and I still follow him today. Naresh Papalo, Tim and Brian, did this just start? That is correct. TGV is new to the company, the relationship starts officially as of today, but this has been in the works for a while. We're happy to have him. He's yeah. a big ad. Right here, Eric Cecil from New York City. We've got Rick TikTok from Scottish Watches, the team. Turkish Meister, our friend from Turkey. And of course, we've got Mike B joining from North Carolina. All right, guys. Alexi Samola from Finland. Guys, in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa, those staying up late with us, thank you very much. I'll do a wrist check, too, because we've got an unusual one here. Part of our Friend of the Brand series, I'm inviting brands that I like onto the channel and I'm giving them a little bit of exposure. If I like them and they like me and HYT, it's mutual, then we get to see really cool watches from notable independents or indies as they like to be called. This is the HYT H0 Gold Blue. It uses a 2N vintage style faded gold, which is not necessarily my style, but the watch is. So the watch is my style, the gold is not. I'm really interested in this watch in titanium or steel, and we're gonna have that in-house very quickly. You can also see that it's a regulator style system where fluid actually tells you the hour, and then you've got the minutes on a conventional dial. This is a 48 millimeter lugless watch, so you can see even though it's a 48. It's nowhere near the edges of my wrist. HYT doing fun things out in Neuchatel. We have an office out in Neuchatel, so I might go visit him. You definitely should. That's a fact. All right. Let me, feel get... the, let, me, let me feel this thing. Is it heavy? It, it is heavy, but it's mostly sapphire because it's yeah. got this giant like cake cover of a sapphire to it. The weight's definitely deceiving because it looks a lot heavier than it actually is. And it's got the best clasp I've ever seen. Check let me show you this clasp, actually. This is this should be on every deployment clasp. There's this little push button trigger that allows you to micrometrically adjust it internally. I don't know why everyone doesn't do that. That's ingenious. And well, I guess I may as well show you how the watch works since I talked it up. It's a very cool system where there are actually two bellows internally and radially you can see that meniscus, the clear and the blue liquid. And as they approach the end of the 12 hour cycle, it retrogrades with actually kind of surprising speed back to zero. All of this is driven by a pumping system on the case back 
back and you can see that it is traditional mechanical watchmaking. There is a traditional heartbeat and Swiss lever escapement pushing those two bellows, one full of blue liquid, one full of clear. So those guys are very cool. We're hoping to get yeah. other independents on the show in the very near future, so stay tuned. Um, all right, so I have one that I want to start with right here. So I actually just... Uh, Technically an independent, but on a very large scale. <laughs> yes, one of the last. Um, so I just came back from a um, travel time and world time event in New York with Patek Philippe. So I felt it was uh, you know, only right that I bring one of my favorites here on the show. Here we have a 5130 Platinum. So this is the, I'd call it um, second iteration. I mean, it's not... A, actually the second iteration, but the, the second most recent iteration of Patek Philippe's World Time. Um, here we have it in platinum with the blue guilloche center dial. Um, absolutely beautiful. You know it's platinum because you have the diamond there at the six o'clock. Um, and I actually, I learned a whole lot about the, the Patek Philippe World Time and Travel Time functions. Most notably that they were uh, all predominantly invented by a gentleman by the name of Luis Cotier, who did a lot of work for quite a few um, quite a few brands. He did work for Cartier, he did work for Lawn Jeans, um, but most notably he did a lot of work for Patek Philippe, uh, and he was the one that came out, uh, invented their original travel time functions and world time functions. Uh, and his, I don't know if it's his grandson or great-grandson is actually uh, an archivist at Patek Philippe today. Yeah. Louis Coche actually invented the world time system back in the 1930s, Patek with its 1415, and then later on, Vacheron Constantin, also during the 1930s, adopted the world time complication. The interesting thing is he continued to evolve the type, and during the 1950s, along with Patek Philippe, he patented the adjuster system that evolved his conventional 24-hour counterclockwise rotating disc and the individual reference cities. He added a system that allowed you to seamlessly jump reference city and let the watch do the math. So you have the ability to change the reference city. Your reference city goes at 12 o'clock, and the watch automatically makes that time zone adjustment. So so whatever reference city you're in, you are correctly referenced at center as well as at 12 o'clock. It's a very cool system that's built on the 240 micro rotor. This is the 240HU for Euro Universal. This is actually probably still the most interesting movement Patek makes. Released in 1977, it's got a micro rotor so you can see everything as though it were a manual and it's super slim as though it were a manual. So I love the fact that it's a beautiful movement and it's the premium automatic. To this day, you tend to see the 324s on most of the autos and very few 240s. Yeah, so, and I really feel like the World Times don't get enough love these days. They're, su they're super simple to use. They're quintessential Patek um, and um, I've just, you know, learned a lot about the references uh, that I didn't know before. It, so, you know, and actually, if you look here at the hands, uh, the the round hour pointer there actually is meant to represent uh, the globe, and that little arrow there that you see pointing there, um, some variations have it there at the top, some have it going all the way through the hand, it represents the uh, prime meridian. So as you can see, a lovely center Soleil style guilloche pattern, galvanized blue. These are wonderful watches, and actually this is one of the larger Patek World Time watches you're going to find, because the subsequent model was actually sized down from this one's 39. This watch was phased out in the form you see here back in 2016 when the 5230 arrived, but it remained a platform for cloisonne enamel right up until last year. So this is still a very relevant Patek and a grand yeah. one. You know, you're going to be... I, I think polarized along the lines of with or without crown guards with the mm -hmm. Patek World Times. A lot of folks are going to see this as an extension of the Calatrava line, and some folks just can't warm up to a Calatrava style watch with crown guards. I actually like it. It gives the watch a bit more presence, yeah. and anything to protect the crown, I'm into. Makes it slightly more casual, too. Yeah. Um, so going off in a, I guess, well, I don't want to say completely different direction because it is a GMT, uh, but a very different look and from another, I'd say, large independent. Uh, is yeah. the rare we're, we're really skirting the yeah. definition yeah. of independent here is a um, rarely seen uh, Rolex white gold Pepsi uh, GMT with the blue dial so uh, this watch is actually still in uh, still in production um, and you've got the white gold case you've got the red and blue ceramic bezel um, and uh, just an absolutely awesome watch this watch came out last it was last Basel World. yes um, where they replaced the black dial with uh, with blue, but still one that you really don't see that often. I'll be real honest, guys. This is an interesting long-term prospect for those who want to get into a Rolex that is super rare because the original 
white gold Pepsi debuted back in 2014 and right up until 2018 it had the black dial. They made this reference 116719 with the blue dial for a single year. The watch in the catalog today looks just like this but it's the 126719 with a different movement and I believe if you look at them externally the only sign of the difference is that the new watch features a Rolex crown between Swiss and made at the base of the dial. That's the only external sign that you're looking at the newer watch. These, of course, being almost $40,000 new, were always scarce watches, but when you go with one year of production for a timepiece like this, you're really scraping the bottom of the barrel in terms of Rolex availability. This is the first one I've seen, and remember, this watch came out over a year ago, so this is a super scarce blue dial white gold Pepsi bezel GMT, and if you're into the look of an oyster on a Pepsi, this is still the only way to get it with the super case and the ceramic bezel. I love this piece. It has incredible mass it has incredible class. Yeah, I mean, one of my absolutely favorite watches, and I think what's so interesting about this watch in particular is when they first came out with the watch in white gold, you had a lot of unhappy people out there wondering why they didn't make it in steel. Um, but if you ever have a chance to see one of these in person and you hold it up against their steel counterparts, um, the white gold definitely, in my opinion, looks very different than the steel coloring. So, and it's, I mean, a completely different feel on the wrist and a completely different wearing experience. So it's very hard to even... Um, you know, compare the two. All right, guys, uh, fun stuff here. I wish there was some interactive aspect. Like, I wish you guys could send me your wrist shots in the box. That would there be needs so to, cool. There needs to be some way, YouTube, please make this happen now that we're friends. Please find a way to let people post stuff that's visual and image-based in these chat boxes. I, I mean, I can censor it. Let me do that. If they post something weird, I'll get rid of it. But give us the ability to interact properly. It's a visual medium. Google, do this. All right, jumping into the box. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm bossing around like one of the biggest companies in the world from my podium here on the top of our boutique. Yeah, I hope they're watching. <laughs> um, so wouldn't be a Wednesday show without an FP Journe. Here we have a, another very rare beast that is a recent acquisition of ours. Um, so we're, here we have an early brass movement Octa Automatic uh, with a bright gold dial. Um, as we've shown on the show before, um, the Gold dial with the brass movement is, I would say, iconic and quintessential early Jorn. It's probably one of the most um, known, uh, you know, early hallmarks of the brand um, and probably some of his most collectible pieces. Um, so I think that these, that this particular reference in general, as we've said, is probably one of the few areas um, that I think you can still pick up these pieces at good prices. Uh, a lot of the other references, um, you know, have rapidly increased. Uh, these have as well, but still, I think that um, there's still a lot of uh, value in these for them to grow. Uh, and there's not, you know, there's, a, you know, definitely not many on the market. They're fun watches because at the end of the day, they're really practical. 120 hour power reserve, that's excellent. It doesn't have to be your everyday watch to keep track. Big date, that makes it easier to see. Important modern brand, check. Wearable size, check. Brass movement, well, you know, this would be normal on any other brand, but in 2004, about mid-year, F.P. Journe transitioned over to rose gold. Now, this watch has a case stamp of 02, and it's one of the old Greater Paris metro area Eleanor cases, so it has both the French and the Swiss hallmarks on its platinum, because right up until about, I want to say 2000. 8-2009, F.P. Journe actually used his original pocket watch case supplier from his days as a bespoke pocket watch producer, and his case supplier was Eleanor of Paris. He bought them in 2008, moved them to Geneva, and most of the folks who worked for the old company still work for the new one. They commute across the border. Today, it is Boitier de Genève, and they make the Journe cases. But the nice thing about these old watches is that they have so many quirks. There's that characteristic yellow dial with its lovely matte grain. There's the smaller case size. There's the brass movement. There's the double hallmarked case from Eleanor. This is just a fun way to look at an early period of an important independent with a near universal style that makes everyone smile. It doesn't have the pretense of a Rolex or a Patek, but it has all of the importance and all of the quality. I really like this piece. I think this is something that it's probably the Octa that people think of when they think of the Octas. Yeah, and, and you know, and one of the reasons why I like the Octa so much, and particularly these early ones, is number one, every single one of them is different. Like, you know, if you hold up two next to each other, none of them are going to look the same. Um, from a distance, you know, it's FP Journe. It has the, you know, off center display of time. You've got the gold dial here, which is really nobody else is doing anything like it. So I just think that uh, it checks every box. 
from the F. Pijorn perspective of a collectible one uh, to have. So, uh, And I was super excited when I came in and I knew that I wanted to bring it onto the show. Oh, and we got a question from Robert Fletcher saying, I don't remember you mentioning this watch as Rolex currently available in boutiques. Did I miss it? No, you didn't because that's a true pre-owned watch. That's a watch box watch. And I know because I checked the papers before I put that on the internet, uh, but that is a true pre-owned piece. So that's not something that was allocated to us on the Goffberg side, just to clear up. I've never seen one of those sitting in a case. Um, I don't know, maybe maybe there's a dealer in, I remember I at once dated a girl from, I think it was Clam Gulch, Alaska. If there's a Rolex dealer there, that's where that kind of thing would hide out. All right, dumping right into the box. Tim is the king of watches in YouTube. Scottish watches, you flatter me. I, I think it's good to share the love. There are many kings and queens on YouTube. Um, and right here we've got Rasmus asking HYT service costs. The only time I've seen an HYT service was back in the watch you want days down in Florida. We sent one in, it was the H1, it was the same movement in the H0 right here, and it was $1,500 to New Chatel and back with work done on a very unique caliber. So I actually thought that was fine because I've submitted JLC chronographs and gotten maintenance bills like that. So this thing is that's crazy. probably about half what Audemars Piguet would charge if they did the service. So I think HYT was pretty fair on that front. And jumping right into the box, we got friends joining late, and we have bump, 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 bump. Quite a few folks. Porsche Maven in the box, just like me, watches and wheels. He's a fan. And then Richard T. Hey, Tim and Brian from Los Angeles. All right, bump, bump, bump. Hey guys, please feel free. Keep the questions coming if you have anything uh, that you want to talk about watch-related here on the show or about any of these watches. Um, you know, keep the questions coming, and let's. Uh... Let's keep talking about these watches on the table. Ted's got a question. For FP Journe, your net worth has to be over one million dollars, euros, and no mortgage. I would actually say there are some pieces that you can pick up pretty pretty reasonably. The, yeah. the Elegant 48 is obviously the leading candidate, and it's a great one because you can swim with it. Chrono Metro Blue? I, I mean, I don't know. If you buy it new, yes, it's reasonably priced. I would say pre-owned, a lot of the titanium sports watches, especially the auto, very reasonably priced secondary. Yeah, I think so as well. I think you could easily opt for that instead of a Ducati or like a Mazda Miata. So if you've got that kind of money for your hobbies and your passions on the side, you could make a Jorn happen. You could also do, um, you know, an older one of these, maybe a slightly different dial configuration um, for probably the, call it mid to high 20s. Yeah, so there are FP Journe options. Is a tourbillon gonna happen? No, probably not. Not unless you implement the five finger discount, but uh, all the same, there are some attainable Journes. Jumping back into the box right here, we got Dustin Van Patten asking, what is Grand Seiko's annual production? They hold it pretty close to the vest, but I'd say it's probably somewhere between 15 and 25,000. So in terms of scale, there's somewhere between like a Blancpain and like an Audemars Piguet in terms of volume. We have another question, Michael Taylor, are all Pateron Luminar Marinas COSC certified? No. Uh, no. No. Not. There was a time when everything with the 6497 that had a seconds hand generally got a chronometer certification, but again, that, that was a general rule. Since they have gone in-house, if you really dig into the Panerai brochure, you can see the standard that they do use, and it's not as strict as the COSC. Okay, and finally we've got Dion Mack joining from Luxembourg, the home of the Schleck brothers, my old favorite cyclists. Welcome, Dion. Thanks for joining in. Let's see. Why don't we talk about? Why, why don't we go? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Why don't we go mid-size brand now? Yeah. So here we have a very unique beast on the table. This is a limited edition platinum um, day date retrograde date um, from Vacheron Constantine pseudo skeletonized dial. You can see the Geneva stripes there through the movement. Um, on the other side, you've got a um, you've got the limited edition number somewhere there on the case. Yeah, it's on the flank. It's hand engraved. Automatic nice. movement there, and just a very cool, quirky, uh, you know, interesting watch. Okay, so the backstory of this watch, this was from the, the one-time pre-Tunno Malt collection, which launched back in 2000. Well, in 2000, they launched the model 47245, also known as the 245 because it was launched in the 245th year of the manufacturer. Now this model was made in 247 pieces. You can see the freehand engraving on the case flank in 2002. The 
247th year of the manufacturer. Platinum 37 millimeters. The watch is interesting because it's old school. It uses a Gigero Lecoultre movement, and Lecoultre movements in Vacheron watches date back to the 19th century, so this is a time-tested combination. But what's really interesting here is that unlike the 245, which had a solid dial, the 247 features an open dial. It is the Malt 31-day retrograde day date. There's a retrograde scale up at the top. If we can get super close to this one, Harrison, I want to show some details. What's really clever is that there's a little pusher adjuster on the flank that allows you to index the retrograde system without deforming your watch using a pen, and it allows you to basically eschew the pusher tool. Note that the indexing Paul arm is actually black polished. The indexing wheel at center features a freehand engraved Maltese cross, and then there's Cote de Genève on the base of the Vacheron module. By the way, we're going to retrograde that because we're almost there. This is a wonderfully is so fun... Cool. Isn't that fun? Yeah. Everything's visible. Vacheron makes the module. Gégère Lecoult made the five-position chronometer-style adjusted movement auto. And, of course, at 37 in platinum, the watch isn't huge, but it feels huge because of the mass. So you get Vacheron's watchmaking on the front, JLC's on the back, and a shape, especially the lugs that are all Geneva. I really like this piece, and I would wear this happily. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's a great size. The lug design lends itself to you know, feeling like it's slightly bigger than it is. Um, the platinum case gives the watch a little bit of heft, and I just, I, I like a watch that draws the eye, um, and that, you know, something that you want to play with. And, you know, this watch, you know, I think checks all of those boxes yeah. for me. If you want a real Vacheron, in the traditional sense of a little bit made here, a little bit made there, all of it brought together in the grand tradition of a tablissage in Geneva, that is a core Vacheron piece. And it's a wonderful one to own because, you know, let's face it, everyone's chasing the overseas these days. That's Vacheron's hottest watch. So and it's stuff great like value. This, yeah. You can pick these up at such a good price. So. Yeah, I mean, in fact, I could even get the price. Yeah. Okay. Is it, I don't even know if it's posted yet. I th it must be. I had a video of this up, like, a long time ago. Okay, so why don't you load up our next watch, Brian? Let me know which one you want to go with. Let us go with, we'll go with the Diva in here. Okay. DB. So, DB. So this watch came in and I just thought it was absolutely awesome because what I've talked about on the show many times before is how hard it is to just execute a amazing time-only watch. And here we have a DB25, 38 millimeters in size, rose gold case. You've got a guilloche center dial. Um, you've got all the hard marks of the D. Bethune brand. Um, uh, on a beautifully executed time-only watch. And you know, one of the features of this watch that I like, um, and I go back and forth on, on what wearing experience I like more, um, is the integrated lugs to the case. So you have the lugs, um, you know, the scalloped out lugs that D. Bethune has become so famous for, but they're integrated into the case, so it's a much more, I'd say, normal watch wearing experience. And overall, um, just a very cool, quirky piece that just, um, you know, I, I fell in love with the moment it came in. So the DB25s are a bit more sober than the floating lug DB27s and 28s. The nice thing about this watch is that it's not just reasonably sized, it's also quite thin, about 10 millimeters thick, and that's impressive considering the six-day power reserve and the automatic movement. The base here is uh, Debatoon's DB2024, so you can see it's got a lot of shock protection going on. There's a shock protection spring on both sides of the balance bridge, there's Inca block shock protection on the balance staff, and then there's this multi-jeweled finger-style, almost trampoline at center that acts as a sort of cushioning element to prevent torquing of the staff, and, and it's not exactly a conventional staff, it's a bearing system for the rotor. So you have shock protection on the rotor, and the reason that there are jewels in there is so that the rotor itself doesn't stick against the springs as it moves against them. This is as good as watchmaking gets, to be honest. I, I wish the watch weren't running because you can't quite see that the balance is shaped like a yoke. It's not a ring. It's actually made of a combination of titanium at its center and white gold at its edge to maximize the inertia. And the thing about this watch is that it's a six-day auto, and it accomplishes all of that without being girthy. A lot of automatic watches are just too large, too thick, too cumbersome because they go for automatic winding and huge power reserves. Think IWC Big Pilot. This watch 
is none of those things. It's graceful, it's real rose lathe guilloche, not the stamped kind. And you can see there's a lovely billow to the dial with the toroidal ring bearing the hours actually rising with a camber above the center dial. Lovely modified skeletonized Dauphine slash Breguet hybrids at center. And of course, on the wrist, you really get a sense of just how graceful this watch is. This could easily be a Swiss Big 3 high horology product, except for the fact that the imagination inside is all Denis Flageolet and De Batoun. This should be their best seller. And th the great thing about them is they'll do this watch in titanium. You don't have to get it in gold. Yeah, no, the watch is, the watch is absolutely awesome. And I think that... You know, we're big believers in Debethune, and I just think that the brand itself and their brand equity is absolutely on the rise. And I think that there's no reason, um, again, why you shouldn't see them being a powerhouse brand producing anywhere from 350 to 500 watches per year, um, you know, several years down the line. I would love to see them stick to their guns and just sell out every watch they make with 150 pieces a year. Right now, that's their goal. They're exactly. starting slow. The most they've ever made in a year, they told me, was something like 403. So that was when the floodgates are open. You're talking real exclusivity with these and guys. And Richard Mill's probably making, what, five, 6,000 watches a year now? I mean, there's no reason that D. Bethune shouldn't be able to produce um, a fraction of that and have them all sell out. The I mean, watches are awesome and he's one of the best living watchmakers in the world. So yeah. Denny will never be your friend. He will never be the life of the party. He will never do a grand tour to entertain collectors, but he will make the best watches available. And as, as a guy who's kind of a background dude by nature, I really appreciate that. All right. Um, by the way, if you guys are following the chat box and you're coming to us late, uh, there's a lot of talk about Tristano from TGV. The Urban Gentry just joined with Watchbox. Mm -hmm. They are now a, a component of our media empire, I guess you could say. Uh, the Urban Gentry is not going to change. It's going to be the same style. It's going to be the same guy. There might be some crossovers where I do some stuff with him. He does some stuff with me. But if you love that channel, it's not going to change. And if you love this channel, it's not going to change. Uh, I, I do think this gives us new options that we haven't had in the past and hopefully gives me more opportunities to take vacations. Hopefully not too many. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, it just, it opens us up to a completely different market of people that watch this channel. Uh, and for us, we really just want to preach the category uh, and spread the watch box message, um, you know, as far as we can. So uh, we think it's going to be a really cool collaboration. All right. So if we hit everything on the table, I think we've hit everything. No. Oh yeah, let's talk about this. Yeah. I love this piece because Glossuta Original is a company that should be the most impressive and renowned of the Swatch brands. And unfortunately, it seems to be the one that Swatch never talks about. This came out in 2010, but you could be forgiven for never seeing the Senator Diary. This is the world's best alarm watch. 42 millimeters, this one's in pink gold, but they make it in steel and that's how I'd buy it. The watch has a 31 day, 24 hour alarm setting system. So you can set the watch to go off on any date up to 31 days in advance and during any one of the day's 24 hours. So it is both an AM, PM, and 31 day alarm with on off function as well. This is the world's best alarm watch. It's right up there with tone, sustain, volume, and musicality, but it's the ability to set it like nothing else that makes this better than any Volcane, better than any Chichere Le Coult, I hate to admit, and better than any Breguet alarm. Hell, I would say if you want something on par with this, you've got to go with the new Patek Philippe 5520P. And even then, it's a dead heat. I love this piece. Let me show you the back. 55 hour power reserve twin mainspring barrels. This is the caliber 113. It's a lovely in-house caliber. They all are at Geo. Uh, they make everything from the movement to the tooling. They even do their own dials these days. Throw it on the wrist. You can see it's a fairly friendly 42, a bit chunky. That's why I'd get it in steel. But uh, it's interesting to see here how this watch at 42 millimeters wears a lot bigger across the wrist than the 48 millimeter HYT. So that's an interesting frame of reference for what a watch with lugs looks like. We'll do one more for the folks arriving late just to see the HYT, because this is almost like an alien spaceship. You can see this is this is 48 millimeters, but without lugs. You can see it comes nowhere near the edge of my wrist. Like I said, I'm interested in this watch personally, but I want mine in steel. And they offer that, so stay tuned. Right, jumping, okay, bump, 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 bump. Guys, thank you for joining us. We got yeah. great live viewership at 260. That's one of the best marks for this show. I hate to leave you hanging, but I'm going to give the final word to my colleague and your host. Th again, thank you guys for uh, tuning into the Watch Insider. I hope you enjoy the show. As always, if you have any questions or there's anything that you want to see on the show, please email myself or Tim. We're obviously we're very receptive to, to ideas, and we want to talk about topics that you guys want to watch. So. 
Um, tune in next week. Um, oh, and please make sure that you follow Tim. Tim, I'm sure, is going to be uploading videos on Omega's new releases and all of the Swatch Group releases as, yeah, they, definitely. as they start flowing out. Yeah, so. that stuff's hitting me first for once, so follow my Instagram, Tim underscore Maso on Insta. This is The Watch Insider. My name is Brian. I'm Tim. And thank you guys for logging on. So.